Through its research and convenings, the Center on Philanthropy and Public Policy seeks to make philanthropy more impactful today and to create a smarter, stronger sector for tomorrow. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker, Dr. Raj Shah, president of the Rockefeller Foundation. Thanks, guys. Raj, we're looking forward to hearing your thoughts on the, on the Rockefeller Foundation's priorities and approaches, as well as you, any insights you might have, I'm sure there are many, um, on philanthropic leadership and governance. So I want to just digress for a, for a minute, if you'll let me, and just share with all of you um, how exciting uh, and rewarding this past week has been for Southern California philanthropy. The vibrancy and activism of the sector was certainly on display throughout the week. So bear with me because I want to recognize some people who are in the audience that really deserve some credit. Uh, again, I was so proud to be part of the philanthropic sector in Southern California last week. So let me start by, by recognizing the LA84 Foundation that hosted an incredible summit, athlete activism and social justice, taking action for our youth. Bob Graziano is here, board member. Bob, congratulations to the entire organization. I want to recognize my colleague, uh, Peter Lahern from the, from the Conrad Hilton Foundation. Some of you uh, may have been honored to be at the 2018 Hilton Humanitarian Symposium, uh, resetting, resetting Our Moral Compass. It was a phenomenal day. Peter, thank you and the board for, for doing that. It was just very, I, I can't say enough. It was so uplifting. Um, and yesterday, <laughs> actually, before I get yesterday, where's my friend Wendy Guerin? Wendy, where are you? There's Wendy Guerin. So last week, we had sort of uh, an unveiling, if you will, of the uh, Office for Strategic Partnerships between, with, the, with the County of Los Angeles and philanthropy. Um, and Wendy at, at the Parsons Foundations and others were very in, instrumental in putting this, 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 this groundbreaking public-private partnership together. Another reason to feel great about the vibrancy and the collaboration of the sector. And then the last thing I want to recognize is, and Cindy Kennard is here from the Annenberg Foundation, I want to recognize uh, something that was really amazing that happened yesterday, uh, the announcement of Pledge LA, an unprecedented announcement by over 80 venture capital and high-tech firms to work with philanthropy to improve the quality of life for all Angelinos with a particular emphasis on those who, who are too often left behind. So, as I said, this has really been an incredible week. And, and Raj, I know you're only here for a short time, but I wanted to brag a little bit about this sector for you. Uh, this is a, a very collaborative sector, um, uh, and a sector that, you know, in our field, everyone seems to be talking about equity, using the equity word. But I have to say, in Southern California, People are really putting action um, behind, uh, behind the use of that word. There's so many exciting things going on that we can all be very, very excited about. So today we have over 150 leaders from philanthropy and the nonprofit sector, government and business with us today. This represents another opportunity to share and learn with one another. And once again, Raj, thank you for accepting our invitation. Um, I want to quickly recognize the hard work of the host committee uh, that put this, uh, helped put this event together, uh, the center's board of advisors, who are many of whom are here today, and I, of course, want to rec recognize um, Dean Jack Knott from the Saul Price School of Public Policy, who, where the center is located, and Jack, thank you for your ongoing support of the center's activities. So let me just simply conclude by, um, I just mentioned it, it really doesn't seem possible, but the center is actually approaching its 20th anniversary. 
and uh, yeah, it's sort of snuck up on us. Uh, and um, we, so we hope you'll you'll join us over the next year as we roll out a number of activities and initiatives that where we we have planned to highlight our 20th anniversary from our upcoming donors and their family forum in February, our national leadership forum on philanthropy and government in early 2020, and uh, as well as a chronicling, a chronicling of 20 key moments in Southern California, uh, Southern California philanthropy. So a lot of things to look forward to. Stay tuned as, as we announce some of these events. So now it's my pleasure to introduce one of the center's board members, uh, John Cabara. John is the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the California Community Foundation. For over 35 years, John has been leading and managing, hate, hate to put that out there, John, uh, a lot of innovative, innovative partnerships. Most importantly, shut up. Most importantly, John is my good friend and colleague, so John, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's another fantastic event that's put on by the center, and let's give it up for Jim Ferris and his team. I mean, it's incredible. I've been involved with the center on its board for about a decade now, and it's been an inspiring and stimulating, exciting time period, and it's incredible that we're coming to the 20-year mark of, the, um, of America's premier academic resource for philanthropy. And the center, with its vision, and many of you have contributed to this vision, has really become uh, a valued and valuable resource for the country in terms of the field of philanthropy. And it's groundbreaking research that has created innovative conversations and partnerships in trying to think about how we use philanthropy, leverage philanthropy in the best way possible to have the greatest impact. The studies have had national impact as well as local and regional relevance and really expanded the debate through well-known speakers and discussions and conferences. And essential to this work has been the center's ability to help foundations and donors and other philanthropic entities to think about how to use public policy and think about the long-term impact of the work we do. Many of you support the center, and we really appreciate your support and financial and moral support that you give to the center. We couldn't be here and reach the 20th year without that kind of support. But a few folks have been with us for, since the beginning. Uh, our philanthropic partners that are listed in a number of places here um, have contributed in, in many ways to the success of the center. And I'd like you to put your hands together and thank our philanthropic partners. I've been to a number of these luncheons and I've seen a number of you here. This, someone said to me, this is like a reunion. And I said, it is. And um, some of you are supporting the center and some of you are coming to the reunion. So um, we'd like you to encourage some of you who want to come back to the reunion to um, help us get to the 20th and beyond. And uh, we would really appreciate and encourage your support of the center and its great work. And if you have questions, talk to Fred and uh, the members of the board as well as the staff to uh, try to engage you in this incredible work. We'll continue the program right after the main meal. Thanks. We're delighted to have Raj Shah, Dr. Raj Shah, here today. Um, and we've been looking forward to this for quite a while. Um, Raj brings over 20 years of experience in business, government, and philanthropy to his role as president of the Rockefeller Foundation, one of America's longest surviving, living, prospering foundations, um, which celebrated its centennial just a couple of years ago, actually. Um, and he assumed the role of president in March of 2017. So he's early on in his journey leading this revered institution, which, um, if you read Joel Fleischman, is credited with making a number of breakthroughs over its history. American public health, models of medical education, and the Green Revolution in India. So it has had a number of successes throughout the years. Not to put pressure on you or anything. Um, 
Um, uh, Raj is a graduate of the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. Go blue. Uh, some of us have worked in Detroit, and we keep finding Elwood, and I keep finding people everywhere from Detroit somehow. Um, he went to the University of Pennsylvania Medical School and the Wharton School of Business. So he's a triathlete in a sense. Um, prior to his appointment at US, uh, at the Rockefeller Foundation, he was the administrator at USAID and he sort of made remarkable progress in innovating their, their work, public-private partnerships, rethinking the bureaucratic structures and delivered some big results in terms of accelerating um, work that in, to end extreme poverty. And prior to, them, to, to his work at AID, he was at the Gates Foundation for a number of years, which coincidentally he developed a partnership at Gates with the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, and also had worked in the Department of Agriculture as Undersecretary of Research, Education, and Economics. So we could sit here and talk all day about his accomplishments to date, but that's not what we want to do. We want to hear what he's thinking as he assumes the leadership of the Rockefeller Foundation. And we're going to dispense with any formal remarks and have a fireside chat. And we're delighted that Monica Lozano, our own, LA's own uh, Monica Lozano, is willing to do that. Um, Monica is the president of the College Futures Foundation, a role she assumed about a year ago um, in improving college access for California's underserved student populations. And of course, you know, um, she has a long career running um, in, in the media. Um, editing and publishing La Opinion, and then on to Emperor Media, where she chairs the board. Um, she also was the former chair of the California Board of Regents. She was a long-serving trustee of University of Southern California. She's on the board of Disney and Bank of America. So she's played a leadership role in um, locally, state, and nationally. And so we're just delighted that she's agreed to have a conversation with Raj. And, and I will reveal one thing, and that is she served on the board of the Rockefeller Foundation until recently. And in a conversation, she said, well, Jim, you know, I recruited him to be on the board of the Rockefeller Foundation. And I said, well, wonderful. Y'all should have this conversation. <laughs> and, and both of them agreed. So with that, let me welcome Raj and Monica. It's true. I was um, a member of the board of the Rockefeller Foundation. I served for about six years there. Um, and then when I took over the presidency of the College Futures Foundation in November of last year, um, my board thought I was overboarded and said I needed to um, go off a couple of organizations. And unfortunately, the Rockefeller Foundation was one of those. I'd served there for six years. And I remember telling Raj at the time what I was most disappointed about was not being able to work with Raj and to see his leadership come to fruition. We were so proud when you were named president of the Rockefeller Foundation. So we have a great opportunity to hear from him today. Um, you know, Jim made a um, nice introduction, talked about your accomplishments, Raj. Um, you know, your, your academic career, your time at USAID, your time at Gates, um, born in Detroit. Your parents are immigrants from India, your first generation. Um, if you could just, to start sort of setting the table about who is Raj Shah, how did all of those experiences in your mind prepare you for the leadership role that you currently have? I, I should say before we start that I, it's really special to be here with Monica. She not only recruited me to the board, <laughs> served on the search committee, and, uh, and actually I was very sad when I was excited for California and students and kids in this state when you decided to take on your current leadership role, but, but sad that you were leaving the foundation. And I've admired your leadership for years. Thank so thank you. It's, it's special to be together. Uh, 
Well, the first question is very personal. I, I just, I, you know, uh, probably not a dramatically unique immigrant family story. My parents are from, uh, are from India. They came in the wave of immigration when this country needed doctors and engineers, and uh, they came in the late 60s. Uh, we, uh, they actually started in LA, and my dad worked for the Bendix Corporation here and helped develop uh, a little radio transmitter that ended up on a lunar module program as part of a, one of the Apollo missions. And it's on display, actually, at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. And so every now and then we get to go together and just look at it. Uh, and I should pay more attention to him, then I could explain to you what it actually did. Uh, but when the Apollo program was canceled, uh, he was looking for work and, and found it uh, at Ford Motor Company. And so my family moved to Ann Arbor and then Detroit, and, uh, and he worked there for more than 30 years. And he, uh, you know, and our, our, our family was about hard work and making ends meet and sponsoring uh, other family members to join, uh, join him and my mother's side here in America, what is now called chain migration. Uh, proudly, proudly bringing family members here to the land of opportunity. And my grandfather, in, in a story that made a huge impression on me in my life, first time I ever met my grandfather, we went to Detroit's old airport, and it was when you were allowed to like go all the way to the gate to receive guests. And so my sister and I had made little signs, and he came off the plane, and he was visiting, uh, visiting us, and he got off the plane to give my dad a hug, and immediately broke into tears. And then they had this very serious conversation in Gujarati, which I barely understood. And so later I asked my, my dad, explain to me why he was so emotional. And the answer was my dad, who is frugal with money and, and spent his life kind of saving and supporting others, had told his father uh, to buy his own plane ticket to come over because it was cheaper if you bought it in rupees than if you bought it here in dollars. <laughs> and, so my grandfather, for the second time in his life, cleared out his retirement account wow. to buy that ticket. Wow. And the first time was for my dad himself to come here. So we, we've just always had this deep commitment to you know, what so many other immigrant families have, I think, which is a passion for this country, a passion for the American dream, a belief that our values uh, speak volumes around the world. I saw that in action when I was working with Bill and Melinda Gates. I saw it really in action from you know, the toughest settings you could imagine in Eastern Congo to the most violent ones you could imagine in Central America to parts of Afghanistan where our capacity to lead around the world with our values as Americans uh, and to communicate that value as we're doing it is really a big part of what we're about. And so, now I'm at Rockefeller and just trying to live up to the long history we've had as an institution. So we'll talk about um, the role of the United States in the world. But um, Raj, I remember when you were selected as president of the Rockefeller Foundation. And like many transitions, um, our outgoing president, Judith Roden, had been you know, very cooperative and made room and allowed Raj to assume the leadership role that he has. But you also had a period of time when you were transitioning out of one set of activities into this. And if I recall, um, you spent a lot of time in the archives. You, you were really interested in better understanding what, what Jim referenced, which is what was the power of this foundation over its 100 plus years um, arc, of, arc of experience. Why was that so important to you to really understand the history of the foundation when you were selected to lead it into the future? Well, I've always felt, you know, I got to study the Rockefeller Foundation when Bill and Melinda were setting up their foundation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it was all about learning what many people have perceived as the gold standard of philanthropy over a long period of time. So I wanted to just immerse myself in that history. And, it was extraordinary. I, you know, I learned, for example, that the major gift that created the Rockefeller Foundation that uh, took place in 1913, 1914, uh, predated an income tax. You know, there was no income tax uh, and therefore no deduction <laughs> to benefit from. 
Uh, it took place in an environment where there was very little federal safety net. It took place in an environment that was before uh, trust busting and uh, labor movements uh, changed the nature of our society. And it took place in the context of a very successful business leader also seeking to leave a legacy that was different than just their, their business success, which had huge positives and, and some challenges associated with it. So uh, there was an active debate in the United States Congress as to whether uh, the Rockefeller Foundation should be a federally chartered institution, whether the vice president of the United States should be the standing chair of the Rockefeller Foundation after the family. Uh, you know, and it was uh, extraordinary to think about what is the role of philanthropy in society from a big picture perspective when you absorb that history. The other thing I learned was, was how focused they were on looking 10, 20, 30 years into the future and making big bets on the relationship be between science and human progress and the capacity to lift up uh, humanity. And, you know, remember science in that era, this was the age of the world fairs. The science meant progress. It was, all, it was a term that represented all technology, really. And, uh, and so they, early on in the debate, said, well, well, what if we brought science to this sort of field of snake oil sales-based uh, medical work? Like, we could support a, flex, uh, you know, a report or a commission, invest in medical schools, bring professional science-based medicine and public health to our own country and to the rest of the world, would that be a way to leverage human progress to lift up the most people? What if we did that in agriculture? Could we move hundreds of millions of people who seem to subsist on these, in these rural communities? And, and the dialogue went on. And, and then the last thing I learned uh, from the history was that deep faith in looking out into the future and making bets on science also involved lots of things that didn't work. Mm -hmm. And the willingness to, to sort of invest what at the time was real money over many decades in enterprises that didn't work allowed them to have some wins that were dramatic. Uh, and someone reminded me recently that for the first 10 years of what we called in the 1950s the Mexican Agriculture Program, which was led by one of our employees, Dr. Norman Borlaug, going to Mexico and, and breeding improved corn and wheat varieties. Uh, the program was an abject failure. <laughs> they were spending money. Every year they debated, like, when do we just pull the plug on this thing and have Norman come home and start making grants in a more traditional format. Uh, and, and then 12, 13, 14 years later, they created, uh, he created something called dwarf wheat varieties that tripled or quadrupled the amount of grain production in wheat. And he then snuck the seeds into his pant pockets and suitcase and went to Pakistan and planted it illegally and, uh, and then took, uh, I keep telling our lawyers that, you know, sometimes you gotta be a little flexible, took, uh, <laughs> took the finance minister and the prime minister to show them the fruits of his labors. And they said, wow, this could transform our society. And that led to, I think, our biggest win, which was the Green Revolution that moved a billion people off the brink of hunger and starvation. So you know, these are, these are tough challenges we all face. But we all, as a community in this room, have a shared responsibility to use the fact that we represent philanthropy I think to take big risks, to stand up for our values, to try to reach the most people we can, and frankly to do so with a sense of courage and conviction and urgency that, that sometimes uh, gets lost in, this, you know, in, in the fight forward. So when you think about the um, portfolio of work, the initiatives of the foundation, taking big risks, um, being focused on the ultimate mission, innovation, science, technology, what are the ways in which you've approached the portfolio of work, and what will the Raj Shah era at the Rockefeller Foundation look like? Well, we, we sort of went back to the basics, and, and I had the benefit of taking on this role uh, it, shortly after the last election, which I think was a time for real reflection at home and around the world. And, and we said, well, what, how could you apply these basic principles to once again lift as many people as possible here and, and on an international basis 
and in doing so, give people a sense of hope that, yeah, by working together, we can tackle big problems, and it doesn't all have to be a zero-sum game. Uh, where we landed was that we will refocus on the fundamentals of human well-being, health, food, power, jobs. And we will uh, aim to make an, you know, science-driven philanthropy work to end energy poverty. There's still a billion people in the world that don't have access to simple electricity. When you look at the technology that exists with solar panels and battery-powered and electronic metering, that's actually a solvable problem. When you look at the fact that six million children will die this year, many of simple diseases, almost all of simple diseases, we know that we can bring predictive analytics, data visualization strategies, geospatial mapping, and other tools and technologies to accelerate the rate of decline and by 2030 end uh, preventable child mortality. We look at our food system and we understand that today's food system, as good as lunch was here, <laughs> uh, today you guys did a great job, uh, makes too many people sick while also uh, leading to the fact that 800 million people will go to bed hungry tonight. And we have had a long-standing 70-year commitment to ending hunger through agricultural productivity. We'll continue that effort because it's working in many parts of the world. But we'll also make big bets on next frontier science that could help change the way most people consume protein and micronutrients and do that in a more sustainable way to achieve real nutrition that keeps more people healthy around the world. And you know that'll be risky work, but we're willing to take the long view as we do it. And then right here in, in the United States, we're very focused on looking at how you could expand place-based opportunity to communities that have been left behind by the nature of the trends in income and opportunity over the last 15, 20, 30 years. And right now, we're very focused on opportunity zones, the element of tax bill that created an incentive for capital formation and deployment in the 8,700 plus designated census tracts around this country that represent opportunity zones. And I'm happy to talk more about that. But that's our agenda. We uh, take on that work with a commitment to partnership, a desire to measure results, and a willingness to learn, but also with a sense, uh, I hope, of real urgency. Uh, and and we'll see if we so succeed. When I, I th thank you. When I look at your the portfolio and the the issues that you just mentioned around food and power, et cetera, those are core Rockefeller Foundation activities. The initiative that you have around jobs, um, much more domestic focused, um, used to be called inclusive economies, and it seems like you've simplified it and brought it home. What was the rationale behind that? And what do you hope to accomplish in, in the area of the future of work and some of the trends that you just described? Well, the, the rationale was kind of goes back to my first answer to your first question, which is, you know, this should be a country defined by opportunity. And in fact, if you were born in the era when my parents came here and when I was born, there was a 90 plus percent chance you would do better than your parents economically. In fact, the people who uh, were on the far end of the curve and struggled the most with that, you, you know, had last names like Rockefeller, you know, because it was the, the top 10th percentile uh, didn't, quite, didn't quite have the same statistical likelihood of doing better than their parents <laughs> for obvious reasons. But if you look at data out of, you know, past 1980, past 1990, it's now probably, it's 50% and, and likely less than 50%. And so think about that. Think about the difference between being born in an era as an American where you have a 90 plus percent chance of doing better than your parents or a 40%, 50% chance. The same is true of poverty. If you look at the, the percentage likelihood if you were born in poverty as a child that you would move into the middle class, it was something like 50% in, in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s. Today, it's half of that. It's 26%. And so we have built a society that just frankly has less opportunity for too many Americans. When you actually map the decline in opportunity across counties in this country, and you take out San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, and a few other places, it is drastic and dramatic. And so the question we have to ask ourselves, and we did after the 2016 election, 
is do we have better answers to recreating an economy that is more just, that has more opportunity, that is less stratified, and that allows us to both compete in the global environment in the next 20, 30 years, and allows us to lift up more Americans in doing so, because you know, ultimately, if we don't have a country and an economy defined by hope for everyone, uh, we've lost something very special. So that's why we're committed to that work. Uh, we looked at the Opportunity Zones legislation very carefully, and frankly, I believe it is the single greatest tax incentive to invest in lower income communities in the post-World War II era. Uh, there are 8,700 plus census tracts that are designated. They have an average poverty rate of 32%. They have an average minority population, Hispanic American and African American population rate of 54%, and an average unemployment rate of almost 13% in today's economy. And the bill was passed, as we all know, at the end of uh, last December. By April, every governor had, and many with our support had designated opportunity zones. Today, we have a partnership with the Kresge Foundation and others to create a first loss guarantee fund for opportunity zone funds that are more impact oriented, and I can speak more about that. But in just the fund formation we've seen, the headline number on all the announced opportunity zone funds is north of $20 billion. So, you know, this is probably the largest tax expenditure we're, we're gonna make in trying to drive capital into lower income communities. And it's either gonna be a huge tax giveaway for real estate that would have already happened, uh, and, or it's gonna be a real strategy for reaching and lifting up more Americans that really do need uh, that extra opportunity. I have so many questions. Um, but, <laughs> so I wanna go to this, um, the issue that you just mentioned working with Kresge. And the, the approach that you've taken to partnerships, and I remember, Raj, when you were first assumed this role, um, I think six weeks into it, you went and you spoke to the Global Philanthropy Forum. And I don't know the exact title, but it had partnership in the title. Um, and people were somewhat surprised because Rockefeller had a reputation of doing things on its own. But you have come into this with this clear sense that you can't progress without partnerships. Talk about that motivation and what you're doing to explore those kinds of, of activities together. Sure, well, I, you know, a friend of mine used to say that he admired the nonprofit industry uh, because it took on the world's most difficult, most complicated, most meaningful problems and then tried to address those problems with the industry structure of the dry cleaning industry. You know, just <laughs> small distributed stuff. Uh, and I've always thought, every time I go to the dry cleaner, I'm like, why isn't there one single chain that has sort of figured this out? Uh, and so, so uh, I, that's basically the answer, is if we're gonna tackle big, huge problems, we need lots of people around the table working together to solve them together at scale. So we have shifted our focus, and we are much more committed to partnership across the board. Our Opportunity Zones work is defined by partnerships with people like Sean Parker and Ray Chambers and Gene and Steve Case, but also traditional legacy foundations that have the capacity to pool their endowments and offer hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of uh, guarantee capacity to nudge capitalism to be most, more impact-oriented in this context. In, uh, we've created a vehicle we call Co-Impact, which I, one of the things I just admired was the way the Edna McConnell Clark Foundation created this platform called Blue Meridian and said, look, not everybody wants to create and run their own foundation. Sometimes you wanna get together and learn with others. And so together with Bill Gates and Jeff Skoll and Nandan Nilakani and a handful of other philanthropists, we've raised about $200 million in a, in a, in a fund designed to be a platform for high impact international giving. And we'll make announcements of the first round of grants out of that platform that will move millions of people out of poverty and hunger and expand educational opportunity in developing countries. I think that's particularly important for international giving because it's just harder to do and it's a much smaller percentage of the total philanthropic sector. But I'd say the partnerships I'm most excited about are the ones that don't yet have, have not yet come to full fruition. And that is, you know, we have to stitch together partnerships with big 
institutional players, local country leaders, not NGOs and nonprofits in order to tackle what we hope to achieve in health, food, power, and jobs. And that's the mindset we take to the work. So um, absolutely, you can't affect the kind of change at scale without having those sorts of institutional and, and government partners. Um, you referenced the elections. And um, Raj, at one point, when you were talking about it in another speech, you said that it was really a call to action an opportunity to demonstrate a different kind of leadership, and that today international cooperation is challenged. Having come out of USAID, um, what is the role for philanthropy on that international stage? And, and more importantly, what about the image of the United States as a partner across the globe in addressing these kinds of issues that you talked about? Well, you know, especially internationally, well, this is true everywhere, but the United States is still the world's unquestioned leader. Uh, I want to say moral leader. <laughs> and and, and I, I really believe that's true. It, it is, I, I can't tell you, you know, if, if we don't pull together the humanitarian community to take action in a place like Yemen, it won't happen. If we don't uh, look 10, 15 years out and track the migration patterns in the 17 countries in the Sahel and identify uh, the links between human and, and gun and drug trafficking and the weaknesses in social service and governance and tackle that issue holistically, others are not going to do it. Um, I've been in setting after setting after setting all over the world where America showing up and bringing optimism Working with others and defining what success looks like is an absolutely essential ingredient to solving global problems. And if you look at the world we live in, I mean, we have a huge choice to make. We can either embrace the opportunity to bring down greenhouse gas emissions. We can embrace the opportunity to end extreme poverty, which is there are a billion two people who live, 1.2 billion people who live in subsistence. And they live in the fragile, most vulnerable, most dangerous parts of the world. Those can either be pockets of long-term global instability, or they can be the South Koreas of the future. And the difference will be the decision we all make as a global community. Those decisions are not made without American leadership. So whether it comes from a particular administration or whether it comes from a collaborative of philanthropists working together, or whether it comes from companies and philanthropists holding hands and saying, this stuff is hard, but we're going to take it on and insist on it. Now, more than ever, we need those voices at the table. We need that confidence around problem solving. And we need that leadership to ensure that the long-term path is still the correct path for our world. As I, as I listened to you, and, and I was thinking about the introduction to today's conversation that Fred made, um, there are a lot of foundations that are talking about equity at the center of their work. Does the Rockefeller Foundation use that language? It certainly appears it's showing up in what you're talking about. But how do you frame this message um, in a succinct way for others to really understand what Rockefeller is about today? Well, we believe in equity. And, and we believe in equity of opportunity and, and values of basic humanity that stitch us together. Uh, I keep reminding my teams uh, when they present me with strategy documents that then are associated with large budgets and big programmatic commitments uh, that that we don't want to pay for building movements. We want to pay for results. And uh, you know, I, there's this, this old joke about Joe Kennedy, where John F. Kennedy on the campaign trail was attacked for having his dad try to buy him an election. And he admitted. He said, well, you know, I spoke to my dad. And uh, he, said, uh, he said he would buy me an election, buy me the election. Uh, but he said he sure as hell wasn't going to pay for a landslide. And, <laughs> and I, like when foundations which don't have the traditional forms of accountability that the corporate sector has or 
or even government with the ballot box has, when foundations get caught up in my humble opinion, sort of uh, describing values, funding movements, and not necessarily focusing on are we delivering results at scale, it can become a little bit of a trap because you start, everyone you spend time with is someone you funded and they said, well, you're brilliant, I love that concept that you believe in and I believe in it too. And then you're spending a lot of time with people who have shared beliefs but you're not necessarily moving the dial forward. So. I, that may be controversial, and I don't mean to be disparaging of folks who are more values-driven in how they discuss what we're about. We're in this work because of those core basic values. John D. Rockefeller started this foundation because of a deep uh, Northern Baptist faith and a belief that it was a responsibility to serve those that were underserved at a time when no one else, including our public sector, took on that responsibility. So we're values-driven institution. I just think un until someone figures out how foundations have proper accountability for delivering results, like my job has to be focused on demanding quantitative measurable results and making dispassionate ju judgments about are we on path or not to achieve it. So, uh, can I say one other thing yes. about that? I, I maybe learned a little of that from Bill Gates. Uh, you know, Bill and Melinda had a, have a deep commitment values based uh, to the idea that all child, all children deserve a shot at life that's fair. Uh, but it was always super quantitative. It's like, okay, we need to immunize, you know, there are 120 million kids born every year. There are 45 or 50 getting immunized. How do we get that to 80, 90? 15 years after we started the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, which was another Gates-Rockefeller partnership, uh, they can actually say that 600 million children have been immunized, 9 million child lives have been saved. When we created Feed the Future in the United States government, President Obama said in his inaugural address, we're going to help small farmers around the world grow more food and, and lift up their communities. And that became a, a major global effort. Uh, but, but by the end of our term, two terms, we could say that 19 countries around the world have gone from 1% agricultural GDP growth to 6% agricultural GDP growth. That 19 million children had moved out of a condition of hunger and malnutrition on a chronic basis because we had data and, and quantitative measures. And I just don't know how to do this work without being focused on those, on those measurable things. I, I know that we're going to go to audience questions in just a second, but um, just picking up on this, Raj, because it occurred you were thinking it through before I left the foundation. So we overlapped um, from March through November, about six months. And you were doing an assessment of the internal organizational structure. And how do you, in fact, bring these sorts of measurement tools into an organization that, using your words, doesn't really have built-in accountability? Can you just talk for the audience here? What did that, what, what sort of change management, what, what was required to move the foundation organizationally towards something that brings the kind of discipline that you're yeah. talking about? Well, I'm not necessarily the case study in how to do this well. <laughs> uh, and I think had you stayed in your role, I might have been closer to that case study. But I think we all have to recognize that, that you, you get in, uh, that institutions over time build their culture, their way of working, their personnel, and their sense of purpose. And every now and then, leadership changes are an opportunity to refresh that. So I admire my predecessor, Judy Roden, who I know spoke here, because she spent three, four years in her first part of her tenure doing that refresh. And I think I just got through an 18-month period of doing that refresh. In our case, it was taking the number of programmatic areas of focus down from about 37 to, to closer to seven or eight. Uh, it was uh, changing or restructuring our staff to focus a little more on the science-driven, technical expert basis that has defined the Rockefeller Foundation for many, many decades, but uh, you know, was an area where I thought we could do a little better. And by the way, I'm grateful I think, for the fact that I got to recruit a leadership team in an environment after that last election when folks are sort of saying, hey, this is our country and our world, and, and we all have to make sacrifices to go 
uh, to go build the kind of world we want our children to grow up in. So I'm super excited about the quality of team we have and, and uh, credit the external environment for creating a lot of opportunities there. Uh, and, and we had to restructure and reorganize ourselves, which is always difficult. Uh, and I was uh, talking earlier about how it has been helpful to be part of a community of foundation leaders and to see the center here, I know, does create that sense of community. Just a place you can go and say, gosh, I think we have to make all these changes. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. What do you think? What did you go through? How, what was that like? Friends from Darren Walker to others in New York, uh, Bill Gates in Seattle, I mean, all over the country and world really were helpful as coaches in getting through that. And, and as you know, that's a continual process, so it never really is complete. Uh, but I'm excited about our direction. We have a strong sense of purpose. We will uh, you know, we'll do our best to enable our partners to get these goals achieved. So as Jim comes up, because I think you've got questions, um, what was it like transitioning? Raj, I'm not sure if it came across in the introduction. Raj was a trustee of the foundation when he then was recruited to become president. And so you're serving on the board, and then you transition into the CEO. What, what was that transition like for you? And um, obstacles you had to overcome in moving from one role to another? You know, I th I, so in retrospect, I can share observations that I wish I had been more thoughtful about in making the transition, because it didn't, mm -hmm. I learned this stuff after the fact. I think maybe because I was a trustee and because I communicated a lot of consistency with the long history of the Rockefeller Foundation, I didn't do enough to communicate the extent to which we'd have to change in the here and now. Mm -hmm. You know, when I took on USAID, my first um, Senate hearing was this really aggressive one about the need for reform or they were gonna shut us down and that was coming from our top supporter, <laughs> Senator Leahy. And Rockefeller was different. I mean, people love the Rockefeller Foundation, as they should. It's a wonderful institution that has been around for 105 years and in my view should be around uh, for at least another 105. Uh, because we need institutions that inspire and inspire because they've proven their impact over time, not, not just aspiring to do it for the first time. Uh, that said, I think all of that fascination and discussion with how great the institution is uh, didn't effectively communicate the fact that we'd have to make some cuts, we'd have to make some changes, we'd have to focus, we'd have to bring in new talent in particular areas of work, and we'd have to reorient ourselves around being a partner to others as opposed to being uh, necessarily just sort of an, an intellectually grounded uh, institution. And uh, so I wish I had, and I think being a trustee made that harder. On the other hand, being a trustee gave me a sense of confidence because I knew what we had been talking about as trustees for years. And I saw the energy to move fast and I have, uh, I'm very grateful. And also because I love our trustees. Like we're, we're a fun, friendly group that has a, a lot to learn from each other. It's very diverse. To have fun yeah, and, and we, have, we happen to have some places where we can unwind in an appropriate setting. So, uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it was, I think that was the benefit of being able to make great. that transition. Great. Well, let me have Jim come up because um, I know Jim loves questions around governance and boards and. You just heard trustees love each other at Rockefeller. <laughs> That's good, right? Yeah. Um, a few questions. Um, you talked a lot about sort of the focus on jobs, especially in the US. Um, several questions are asking about what do we do about public education and how does the ability to invest in people lead them to access the opportunities that get created? And if y'all thought about that. Sure. Well, the Rockefeller Foundation is not as active on public education, although we're quite uh, supportive of the large philanthropic communities around the country that are. On a personal basis, I think to compete in the future, we need to shift from a K through 12 to a pre-K through 14 mindset uh, and a mindset that is doing things differently to prepare more and more American kids for the future job market that is, is going to be dramatically different from the one we have today. Uh, I, I think if you look at how our tax code intersects with education in this country, uh, for all practical purposes, it's, it's a regressive reality. And we should be having a serious conversation about 
how we encourage lower income families to save and have the security of savings in particular for college and, and higher education to, to give their kids the confidence that that's something they can aspire to. I'm just on a personal basis find very compelling the data that shows that a little bit of savings can change the outlook of a child pretty considerably uh, over the course of their, their youth and their early education. Uh, I also think there have been, you know, this is, uh, we were talking at the table about, uh, what's the name of that book that we were talking about? Anand, Winners take all. Anand's book, Winners Take All. I don't know how many of you read it, but the takeaway for me is philanthropists, foundation sector partners, et cetera, have to be tough-minded about talking about engaging in and advocating for policies that will change the structure of opportunity in this country. We're trying to do that when it comes to tax code and opportunity zones, investment, and jobs. I'd encourage those of you that are more public education oriented to say, you're gonna do good things, but you're also gonna think hard about the structure and engage on the politics of changing the way we educate American children. Um, so one of the questions was, have you read Winners Take All? <laughs> <laughs> um, but are there other books that you're reading that sort of, sort of catalyze your thinking about what is possible for Rockefeller and the work of Rockefeller? Yeah, I mean, I, I fly a lot, so <laughs> I get to read a ton. Uh, for you know, Hans Rosling, uh, the late Hans Rosling, who was an epidemiologist out of Sweden, had a phenomenal book come out after his passing called Factfulness which I highly recommend. It's a different way of thinking about the world we live in, and it gives you a clear sense of how problems that you might think are not solvable, extreme poverty, energy poverty, children dying in childbirth, mothers dying in childbirth, how those are solvable and why. And so I'd encourage you to, to look at that. That, that, remi that reminded me that the Rockefeller Foundation has a, a task of aiming high when we set our goals and aspirations, and we'll fail sometimes, but we'll keep at it until we get there. Uh, there's a book called uh, about China and artificial intelligence by uh, an investor and an, and an AI scientist named Kai Fu Li, uh, who just did a book talk at the foundation, and I read his book. You know, there's no question in the world that, in my view, that especially when it comes to healthcare and artificial intelligence automation in the way we do diagnostics and treatment, that China will be light years ahead of the rest of the world in doing that. And it's a reminder that you know, even as we deal with these macro tensions in the, in the trade and other sectors of that relationship, foundations, institutions like ours have a responsibility to say, what is the most relevant innovation to saving children's lives wherever it is in the world? And if it's an app developer in China crunching on the data of 100 million customers, we want to work with that partner to bring those solutions to vulnerable populations. So those are just two recent ones uh, that I'd, I'd recommend. You had a book on leadership that I think you distributed to your team when <laughs> yeah, you first yeah. came in. <laughs> yeah, I had two books I, I, uh, I shared with my team that I just love. One is, uh, it's called The American Way, and it's by, it's the story of the turnaround of Ford Motor Company and Alan Mulally, who was the exceptional CEO who led that turnaround. Remember, Ford was the only of the big three that didn't need a federal bailout. And they didn't need it because Alan, when he got there, uh, mortgaged everything, including the Blue Oval logo, raised 20-some billion dollars and invested it in a change management effort that turned the company around. I, and one of my favorite part of that book is a business management process he calls the business plan review, where everyone sits and talks about their goals and their performance in a big circle once a week. And Alan, who helped me put this in place at USAID, tells, told me this great story about how when he started, he went, you know, he went around every single executive and said, okay, you tell me your, your three to four major objectives and whether you're green, yellow, and red against that objective, I'm not judging you. You know, you just tell me, but do it in a circle with all 25 of the senior executives sitting together. So he goes around the room. Everyone to a person is green, 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 green on every single <laughs> scorecard, okay? And these have metrics and this and that. And uh, it gets to Alan, and he says, okay, you know, this is my first time doing this. This is great. The way this works is you tell me how you're doing. Here's the only problem. 
you all just said you're green and we're gonna lose $18 billion this year. <laughs> and if this happens two years in a row, this company will no longer exist. Uh, and then he talks about the culture change that had to happen for people to say, you know, I, I have a red and I need help from someone. And you know, this it's about culture. And we had the same thing. We put that process in place at Rockefeller and uh, it's still a work in progress, but we're starting to get there, that open, honest, critique. Uh, the second book is my, my old golden oldie favorite is Endurance by uh, William Shackleton. I love that book in part because it's such a crazy story and you know <laughs> it was all about adventure and new frontiers. Have you all read it? Who's, who's read it? Yeah, it's a classic and I used to on a good day climb mountains a little bit so I, I love that sort of spirit of adventure. But my favorite part of the book is when they're, you know, they're shipwrecked on, on an ice flow in the Antarctic and they have to get back and they take a small boat and they get on this small island and they get up to the top of a mountain and they just sort of jump down the mountain and they drop 1,200 feet and they miraculously survive. And it's just a reminder that like the best stories have a whole lot of luck. And you know, as much as we think we're experts in designing our future, uh, you want to just put yourself in a position where you have the chance to get lucky. <laughs> and, and so it's a, it's a fun read also. Um, we talked a lot about partnerships and collaboration today. Um, how do you decide when not to do a partnership? Or what are the ingredients, the secret sauce that makes partnerships work? Well, I think the, the biggest ingredient in terms, of, in terms of what makes it work is a shared sense of what success looks like. And I would argue in quantitative and measurable terms. So you know, the difference between a big partnership that says we're going to change agriculture in 19 countries in Africa, which was what was referenced, the Alliance for a Green Revolution for Africa, that would have been an interesting, nice partnership that didn't have a lot of purpose and meaning had it not been tied to our measures of success, our farm income, agricultural GDP growth, and child malnutrition, and that the numbers were coming in telling you that's working. And I see lots of partnerships, especially when I was a USAID, but also in the philanthropic sector where there's a lot of, we make an announcement because we're doing something really nice and it's exciting. Uh, but there isn't a mechanism to sort of say in a quantitative way has something worked over time. Uh, and then it's hard to keep everybody focused on those things. I mean, the other ingredient to partnerships that is kind of essential are resources. And, and so I kind of quickly make the distinction between partnerships that appear like they have the resources to be successful and those that don't. And I bet on the former <laughs> any day of the week. You want to um, talk a little bit about the partnership you have with the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative? Yeah. And the Communities Thrive, Thrive Challenge? Yeah, so, so we partnered with uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan to say, uh, you know, we, we are looking for community-based solutions to, the, to expanding the reach of opportunity in this country because we wanted to learn from all communities around the country. And we each put up a certain amount of money. I think we have 10 finalists, all of each of which are getting a million dollars. But more than the money, the recognition, a little bit like the Hilton Prize, although you do it with such elegance and now such high impact, uh, you know, a little bit like that prize, we want to lift up the prize winners and really help them scale uh, their efforts. Uh, I don't think I can speak to who they are just yet. I know there's a great contestant in the final 20 from LA. Uh, and that's exciting. They've been announced. That's Home the Boys. Homeboys Home Boy project. Yeah, uh, so that's excellent. But uh, but the the idea was to kind of broaden that learning to do it together with the CZI, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, uh, in part because we want to be committed to this over the long term, and we want lots of partners to work with us on scaling the most effective and most important uh, enterprises that have the opportunity to be successful. So. You know, this is one example of, of uh, some of the partnerships we've been building along the way. So um, a final question, and that is, you spoke a lot today about the, the work Rockefeller is doing within the U.S., but your long history is doing a lot of international work. What are the changes in that landscape for philanthropy that you see, and how are you adjusting 
the Rockefellers approach as a result of that? Well, the single biggest change is that the, is that the problems we want to solve, whether it's energy, poverty, which by the way is just poverty. It's just people who, you know, girls who can't read at night and are violently attacked because there's, they don't have the protection of public lighting. Uh, it's, it's, I call it energy poverty just to measure it, but it is, it is subsistence poverty. Uh, or, or child mortality, which again, you know, is just children ages one or two or three or four dying still of diarrhea, pneumonia, or malaria primarily or neonatal sepsis, uh, you know, or, or hunger, or hunger, which is uh, both, re, you know, both observed hunger, which is not having enough calories per day, but also hidden hunger that robs an additional several hundred million children of their futures because they're not getting the right micronutrients and proteins despite getting enough calories. In this day and age when in America we waste 40% of everything we, uh, of all our food. Uh, you know, the, these are solvable problems. The biggest shift is these problems exist in societies and in economies that are far more robust than they used to be years ago. So uh, th this is um, why you should read Factfulness. It'll, it shows you that there's a lot of extreme poverty in India, a country that's been growing at 10% a year or 9% a year for a decade and has its own collection of public capabilities, great technology, amazing scientists, philanthropic billionaires that can make unique investments. So our task now is less about going in and solving problems as the Rockefeller Foundation and more finding that usually science-driven insight that convinces everyone that a problem is solvable and then pulling them together. So in India, for example, we're, we're launching this effort that we call Precision Public Health but we can now use geospatial data and administrative data in, and predict which families are most vulnerable to having a mother die in childbirth or having a child uh, be chronically malnourished. And if you can go into an Indian village in Rajasthan and predict not just which village, but which household is most vulnerable, you can then take the limited public outreach capacity they have. In India, they're called ASHA health workers or community health workers and have them use digital tools to target and go serve precisely that most vulnerable household. That level of, of targeting, enabled by advances in data science, is going to help us get to zero in terms of the, the almost 900,000 children in India who die under the age of five. And we're going to do it with Indian philanthropists, Indian government, Indian medical care providers, and it's not some Rockefeller Foundation effort, although we can be the data science engine that produces the visualization and the mapping and the, the central nervous system that helps a community succeed. And that's just an exciting role to get to play. It, it, it leverages our long history and it delivers a real result, but we'll do it fundamentally in partnership with partners we respect, admire, and bring a lot of capacity and can be unlocked to be even more successful. Um, you know, um one of the terrible truths of philanthropy is excellence is self-imposed. And from today's conversation, it's really clear that you've taken this vague but very aspirational mission about all mankind, human, the, the, improving the human condition of all mankind, and you've married it with a strategic vision of how you go about producing results. And so I think that's very um, important for everyone to take away. Um, thank you for coming. Um, come back <laughs> when you have some more stories and successes. Um, and join me in welcome, thanking Raj for coming. Thank you. Thank you.